All right, today's webinar is on the topic of uh, truck parking, and this will uh, last through the uh, duration of an hour. All right, I'm excited to be uh, the facilitator and moderator of today's webinar. Uh, we'll have three presentations today. The first one will be from Trucker Path. Another is from the North Central Texas Council of Governments. You might hear NCTCOG or NATCOG. And then finally, uh, we have one from the uh, American um, Transportation Research Institute. And then finally, we'll have a question and answer uh, session at the end, along with local updates and closing comments. And uh, before we begin any further, I'd like to also introduce our staff uh, with the Council of Governments uh, that is uh, uh, taking different roles in this webinar. Uh, again, my name is Trey Pope. I'm an air quality planner. We also have Jason Brown, who is a principal transportation air quality planner. We also have Anthony Moffa, who is an air quality planner, as well as Juan Baron Luna, who is an air quality planner. I'd also like to uh, discuss the um, saving money and reducing truck emissions program. You'll see that uh, it has an acronym as SMART with an E at the end. Uh, the saving money and reducing truck emissions program is an initiative that connects the trucking industry with emission reducing and cost saving technologies, as well as strategies to help drivers, owner operators, and fleet managers to reach their sustainability goals in a cost-effective manner. We work to build relationships with industry and local governments and to share information and resources, as well as promote the use of smart way verified technology products. So with that, our first presenter is Chris Oliver. And uh, Chris is the Chief Marketing Officer at Trucker Path, which is a provider of a wide range of truck driver-centric mobility products, including the Trucker Path app used by approximately 1 million truck drivers. And now we'll ask Chris to provide some insight on the status of truck parking, as well as the solution that Trucker Path offers. Chris. Thanks, Trey. Thanks for having me today. Uh, you can go ahead and go to the next slide. There we go. So just a, a quick introduction to, uh, to Trucker Path for those who aren't familiar. Aren't familiar. Uh, the quote here, I think, says it all. I've heard it many, a lot of times. You know, if if you took Waze, the popular mapping app, and Yelp and jammed them together, that baby would be Trucker Path. Um, on the Waze side, um, we offer truck navigation, truck specific. So the way that works is, uh, users enter the dimensions of their trucks, and we route them accordingly to make sure that they stay safe of low clearance bridges, weight limits on roads, you know, no truck roads, et cetera. Um, that's pretty standard. What's what's neat about that is that the ways like component is if by chance our algorithms and data sets aren't right and they make a mistake and route someone to where they, sh they can't go or shouldn't go, the users are able to tell us by pushing a button what the problem is. And then that comes back into our data set and um, kind of self-improves our navigation over time. So um, it all comes together to be what I think to be one of, if not the best navigation platforms in the industry. The other side is, is kind of the fun side, the what Yelp. Uh, we've got hundreds of thousands of POIs on, the, on, on Trucker Path. Um, most of those were cultivated through suggestions from the driver community. And um, all those are geofenced. So we ask you know, drivers when they arrive to give, provide a rating and review, you know, all the Yelp things that you're used to seeing on Yelp, photos, you know, is it a great place for tacos or pizza or whatever the case may be? Um, and we get a, a lot of traffic and a lot of input from drivers. I'm sure you all know drivers aren't uh, shy about sharing their opinions, especially when they know they're sharing with each other. Um, and then most germane to the, our conversation today is we've got about 20,000 locations identified um, within the Trucker Path app where trucks can safely and legally park. Um, all of those have been geofenced. And um, when someone arrives at one of those locations to park or just to visit to check things out, we ask them to look around and, and tell us how many parking spaces are available. Not exactly a number. We ask them to really simply to just ask, are there some spots available, lots of spots available, or is the lot completely full? 
that seems a little bit general, but when you have a million people feeding that all the time, it starts to become really actionable. And you can see here in the picture that we have on the screen, uh, give you an idea of what someone would see at this particular Love's location in Illinois. You can see that three minutes ago when this picture was, the snap was taken, there were some spots available there. Um, so that type of information is, is actually the number one most searched um, service that we have on the Trucker Path app. Is, you know, we, help, we help drivers find good, safe parking um, fairly reliably. But you can go ahead and go to the next slide. <clears throat> so here I'm going to steal a little bit of dance thunder. This is some some ATRI data um, published by ATA, um, but you get the gist here that you know they cite there's 313,000 trucks parking spaces, not locations, but spaces available in the country. Um, that's one for every 11 drivers. Uh, that's already kind of an upsetting ratio. You know, that means 10 don't have a parking spot. Um, and then we really get into the nitty gritty is what I want to talk about today. And, what, what, what their study found was <clears throat> on average drivers spend 56 minutes looking for parking on a daily basis. That's a tremendous amount of time. I can't, you know, if I have to spend three minutes at the grocery, I'm done, I'm going somewhere else. So almost an hour a day spent to look for parking. And that, you know, not only is that frustrating, uh, it eats into the available hours of service. And because most drivers are paid by the mile when they drive, it eats into their paychecks. So here's a couple of numbers here that, that I think really hit home hard. That's $5,500 a year in lost revenue for time they spend looking for parking. Um, and we're just talking about dollars here. Uh, maybe someone else will cover the emissions and other things that come with this, but that's a significant amount. And then that's a 12% pay cut. And uh, so, you know, it's a, ma it's a major problem. And, and there, plus there are the safety issues and when they can't find parking, having to park on a berm or somewhere they shouldn't be. It's just something that we need to address as a nation. It's, it's not, the truckers are the lifeline of our economy. I have often referred to trucking as a whole as a circulatory system for our economy. And um, this, this is a major inefficiency that, that, you know, really does need to be addressed. And it's not new news. It's something that's been known for well longer than the 25 years I've been working in the industry. So um, if you wanna go ahead and go to the next slide, um, I wanna talk through a little bit of math. Um, if there are anybody, if there's anyone in the audience who's a mathematician, um, I get it, this isn't all perfect, but I just wanted to share some numbers here and a little bit of math to illustrate a point. Um, again, I've been in the industry for over 25 years and there's always been a driver shortage. How big it is, that's arguable. You hear numbers all over the place, but. We pulled up a, a stat, a quick stat here that says, you know, 80,000 drivers short in 21. Um, Lord knows in 22, a lot added. So that may have changed a little bit, but let's just look at that number for a little bit. Okay. So there are about three and a half million drivers in the country. And these are you know, long haul over the road truck drivers. Um, and then, like I said, on the previous slide, that's a, where they experience a 12% productivity loss on time spent looking for parking. So just again for math for for example for, for example purposes, if you take 12% of that three and a half million, that's 420,000 call it units of productivity that are lost when it, when all these drivers are looking for parking throughout their shift. So 56 minutes, 420,000 units of productivity are lost. Imagine if we made just a dent in the available parking spaces and how easy they are to find and just reduce that 56 minutes by 25%. If I remember correctly, that takes it down to about 42 minutes. Um, still way too long to be looking for a parking space, um, but it's an improvement, a 25% improvement. Following the simple math, you take 12% minus 25%, takes you down to 9%. So instead of losing 12% productivity, we've only lost 9% productivity now. Again, still too much, but it's a, it's a nice reduction. And now apply that math, the three and a half million drivers, a 9% productivity loss instead of a 12% productivity loss, that's 315,000 units of productivity. When you compare that to the 80,000 unit driver shortage, so that, that, that covers the gap, that really helps to close the gap and reduce the amount of pain that we as an industry experience by the driver shortage. Now, I understand this isn't a perfect scenario and if automatically reduced parking by 25%, there's no more driver shortage. That's, I get, that's not exactly how it works but no one can argue that it would make a significant dent if every driver was able to drive 25% further every day and get that much further down the road. It's 25% more miles. That means that they're going to take, their paychecks are going to get a little bit bigger. 
and they're going to be closer to their destinations within the ship. So, you know, parking has a lot of issues, safety issues, admissions issues, et cetera. But just in simple productivity alone is a, is a real solid argument to how important it is to the industry um, and the productivity industry. And then for us as consumers, you know, the, the reliability of the circulatory system of our economy. You can go ahead and go to the next slide. So how do we address it? Well, in, you know, in the fairly recent past, there have been some bills introduced um, that are earmarking pretty significant amount of money um, to help with the parking issue. Now, that surely doesn't hurt, you know, close to a billion dollars. So that should start to help. Um, that, that money be distributed in the form of subsidies and mandates, of course, like almost everything is. Um, and then there's the technology approach. You know, there's a lot of ways to approach this. And, and a lot of business models, um, both for-profit and not-for-profit, are, are looking at ways to address the issue. And there's location-specific data feeds. You know, Joe's Truck Stop has an app, and they're able to just broadcast how many spots they have available. Uh, there's crowdsource data, real-time data, like we collect at Trucker Path. Like I said, crowdsourcing is just when you ask a large crowd to give you information. And that's what we do via those geofences at parking areas. Um, we also, because we've been collecting that data for so long, um, pretty much since Trucker Path was born five, six years ago, um, we've got a heck of a good database there. So um, data miners are able to use that information, obviously, to report historical availability, but then also to show uh, our users predictive availability of parking based upon the history at that location. Um, there's reservations. I've had several conversations with the folks at Texas A&M, uh, UW, uh, University of Wisconsin, and others about pilot programs they've put in place and just, you know, shared my experience in the industry and also here at Trucker Path in ways that they can maybe approach, you know, trying to fix fix the issue there. Um, I guess at the, at the, the fancy end of the scale, um, there are some locations that have cameras that are equipped with AI that are available where you can log in and actually see the entire parking area, which spots are taken, by whom um, they're monitored, and that information can be used for commercialization uh, for reservations and things like that. So the real key here is to, to proliferate the availability, the availability data to as many carriers and drivers as possible so that when they approach an area, they're able to kind of scan and see as easily and practically as possible where spots are available or should be available um, so that they can navigate to those as efficiently as possible and cut that 56 minutes down as much as they possibly can. Okay, can go to the next slide. So what's the winning formula? I'm not going to pretend like I have all the answers. You know, if, if I did, I probably would have done it already. But um, some of the obvious things that we should consider as an industry is, you know, just adding to the capacity that's available. You know, in a perfect world, like I said in the first slide, you know, there's one spot for every 11 drivers. Not all 11 drivers need to stop at the exact same time, but most of us humans like to stop at night and sleep versus driving. Uh, so nighttime demand is when demands at the largest, but trimming that of one to 11 ratio down is, is a pretty significant um, opportunity that um, I think you know some of the money that could be coming from the government um, would be put, put to use nicely. Um, there are a lot of technologies available. I talked about our crowdsourcing approach. Um, there are res private reservation systems that are available. Um, I'm a big believer in the free market. And um, I think with uh, uh, the possibility of, of the government injecting a little bit of money to drive private sector development and de um, deployment of their technologies, you know, that competition uh, creates a good, healthy environment, both for, for capitalism as well as uh, the ability for people to hone the approach and really find the best way to use it. The key is it needs to be easy. It needs to be ubiquitous. Um, ultimately, as, as we continue to mature in the industry and have solutions available, um, the drivers are going to determine the best approach for us, and uh, they'll most certainly make it evident. Okay. Great. Thanks so much, Chris. Um, yeah. So with that, uh, if you have any questions, um, anybody will say that for the end. Uh, in the meantime, uh, we've got Chris's email address displayed, which uh, you also see in the presentation and the recording uh, in the future. So thank you so much, Chris. I would greatly appreciate you sharing information with us um, on this app that provides much valuable resources uh, for truckers in real time. All right. So uh, with that, uh, for our next presenter, we have Mike Johnson and uh Mike is a uh, principal planner with the Goods Movement team. 
Uh, Mike has been with COG for eight years. In that time, he's worked on several major studies uh, that includes the 2018 uh, parking truck study. And in 2022, the goods movement team completed Freight North Texas 2022, which is the region's freight mobility plan. One of the major focuses of this plan is truck parking, which Mike will now discuss in his presentation. Mike. Thank you, Trey. Uh, thank you. Thank you for having me here. Uh, truck parking is one of the, our favorite subjects to talk about. We have a running joke uh, on the freight team that everybody wants to talk about truck parking, but nobody wants to pay for it. Uh, but that's one of the things we're trying to solve. Uh, next slide, please. As Trey, as Trey said, uh, we did our first truck parking study in 2018. Uh, the way that you can really dif differentiate between this and what we're trying to do today is this was about identification. This truck parking study in 2018, we looked at where our truck parking was, both short-term, long-term. When we say short-term, that's like staging parking, brake parking, long-term is overnight. Uh, we want to identify quarters of concern. We want to identify where the existing truck parking was, how many spots there was, uh, what amenities were at this. We did a driver survey. We really try to dig into what was there. One of the interesting things we found in 2018 that plays into a big part of what we want to do in 2023 is that there was no public parking in terms of tech, uh, tech safety rest areas within our 12 county region in the MPO's boundaries. Uh, so that looms large with, you know, our quarters of concerns with addressing par uh, truck parking needs. Uh, next slide. Trey also made mention of our Freight North Texas 2022, our regional freight mobility plan. Uh, one of the big uh, areas of focus is truck parking. And one of the other big elements of focus is implementation. And that's the focus of this update or our new truck parking study we are in the process of doing right now is. The big focus is the first one is implementation. This one is, I'm sorry, I had said that backwards. The first, uh, first one is identification. This one is implementation. We want to build off of what we've done in 2018. We want to build off of knowing where these corridors are concerned, where truck parking is needed, these 15 to 20 mile corridors we ID across the region and really dig into that. And then along with that, look at all these funding sources that Chris uh, was talking about in his presentation uh, and really be able to use that to add truck parking in our region and of course, we always want to look at the technologies available. Next slide. So this is just how your typical uh, study is built here at the COG. You do data collection. We want to look up, re update all the data sets and things like that we did in the 2018 study. And then we really want to dig into the, we have been digging into the funding information. And of course, then we use all this information to conduct, conduct an analysis and uh, then we want some good, solid recommendations of implementation, this framework in which we can use this, uh, use and implement the funding. Next slide, please. Okay, so data collection. Of course, uh, when we did the truck, uh, truck parking study in 2018, there was studies out there on truck parking, but there's way more now. This is one of the really cool things. As Chris said, there's a lot more tension on truck parking now than there was uh, six, seven, five, six, seven years ago, you just had that barely got Jason's law stuff started from Map 21. And now there's a lot more information out there. You know, we're reviewing what Atri's done, TTI is done. We're reviewing uh, statewide, federal uh, inf additional information on truck parking. I do want to give a shout out to TechStot. They finished their truck parking study in 2020. It's been a great resource. It's something we greatly appreciate them completing. But we've seen that from a lot of other states as well, as uh, people are now required to do a state freight plan that trickles down with these follow-up studies like truck parking. So it brings a lot more attention. Uh, once again, uh, Chris talked about drivers' hours of service and how much they play into it and how how much the, the rules, and we, we also want to know how much the rules have changed over the past couple of years, not how much, but they, they, they've been tweaking the rules over the past couple of years because of the pandemic and the supply chain issues. And of course, we want to look at our quarters concern. Uh, we, want, we, we maintain our own regional truck stop inventory. 
Uh, the reason why we do that is we, you know, there's certain information sets we want quickly and easily. And of course we keep that up to date as best we can. And then we do a big push when we do a study like this. Uh, we look at uh, where the truck parking is, city, county, freeway, exit, the number of spaces, uh, amenities available at those truck parking locations, and if there's any uh, cool and specific technologies there. And of course, uh, we want to dig into technology strategies. Uh, Trucker's Path has come up a lot since we've uh, started on this um, update to the truck parking study for this year. And of course, state, federal, local uh, laws and ordinances, uh, this plays in big when we're looking at like where do we need additional truck parking when it comes to short term and overnight, because even cities that have invested heavily in freight uh, land uses in freight infrastructure, they have some pretty strict rules when it comes to truck parking. So it, it, it all snowballs and it all combines. And of course, like I said, we're really, really into funding this time. Next slide. Uh, this is just an example. This is just our uh, truck stop inventory visualized. Uh, the big thing I always like to point out with this is you will see how much is pushed to the periphery, how much is not in the central uh, part of the region. And of course, this is all private, except for one spot on 287, which is not actually, it's a rest area, but it does not have any truck specific parking. Next slide. Okay, so with the analysis, like I said, we wanna look at our corridors of concern from 2018. These are uh, areas like north, north of downtown Fort Worth up into Denton, areas like South Dallas, uh, just north of downtown Dallas, east of Dallas, west of Fort Worth. Um, these are areas where there's a lot of freight activity to obviously, once again, they tend to be on the peripheries of the area. And there's real interesting ones like South Dallas, where you have a lot of truck parking, it's just not enough. So we want to look at those, make sure those are still relevant. And we want to add any additional quarters of concerns to this analysis, if there are any. One we've already identified is South Fort Worth, uh, south of uh, 20 in Fort Worth, north of Burleson. Uh, we've seen a what could be said as an explosion of freight growth in there in the last three four years. It's it's uh, there there's always been a little bit of warehousing down there, but it's really picked up in the last couple of years. And warehousing brings more trucks, brings more needs for short term and long term parking. So a big part of the analysis is this looking at the funding and how we can implement that, creating this framework into that. To go along with that, the way we want to use our quarters of concern is we want to get more localized and identification of things. Like let's say there's some uh, text dot owned land on 35W. How can we take advantage of that with these different funding sources, work with text dot and possibly add additional truck parking into the region? There's truck parking funds available for augmenting or adding to existing truck parking locations where the concrete slab is paid for by the government and the truck stop itself and the amenities are paid for by the private sector. The we key to this is finding these localized zones where we can actually apply that kind of thing, building this framework. And of course, not all technology solutions work everywhere, every way, the best way. We want to see which technology solutions out there are the best for us and the best for our region. Next slide, please. This is just an example you guys have to kind of squint to see it, but this is just an example of how we're looking at that funding on the left side. Is the different kinds of funding available? Uh, what kind of funds they are? And then the different kinds of truck parking infrastructure infrastructure can be used with these funds. And then very small, uh, I'm sorry, on the left is that stuff. On the right is the uh, how much is available and local match and things like this. We're using this to kind of identify the best, best funding sources for the best kind of projects we could possibly do. So that's that's the role of this. Uh, we really wanna start uh, with the newest, the IIJA, there's a big emphasis on discretionary grants or competitive grants, as Chris talked about. There, so these are new plots of money. Uh, as you can see, there's at the they're listed at the bottom there in this, there's a lot of green there. That means opportunity to be competitive. That means 
partnerships. That means working together with local cities. That means working together with textile. It means working together with private uh, entities to try to get truck parking into the region. All right, next slide. Okay, so what are, what are we trying to get out of this? Uh, like I said, the big thing is, is we want to implement. We want to have some projects or po potential projects that we could implement over the next year or so. Uh, part of that is um, building this framework we'll be talking about. He's actually identifying those zones and then identifying the funding to go along with those zones. And of course, uh, we want to have a good list of technologies. Uh, Chris did a great job of saying that there's no one, there's no one trip. There's no one solution to any of this. This is a multi- uh, faceted approach. You're going to need technology to help maximize your existing capacity to make sure drivers know where to go so they're not wasting their time, not wasting their hour of service. Uh, and that the way you do that is with information, getting that information through apps like Trucker's Path, through signage uh, that we've seen in the Midwest and that TxDOT is working on in I-10. We want to see some of that. What makes it a little bit harder and unique here is those kind of signage where you have the uh, DMS signs or the uh, information signs telling you how many spots you have are usually lined up with um, pu public parking. But we don't have public parking here. We have private parking. So if we do something like that, we're going to have to work very heavily with local uh, truck stop locations and see if they're willing to share their information on something like that to put on a sign. So uh, we got we got to look at different technology solutions in that way. Uh, what can we actually do here? So that that is the crux of it. Uh, next slide. Uh, right now, we've done our data collection. We've done our uh, literature review. We've looked at refreshed our data sets, all that stuff. Like I said, we're in the progress. You saw a little example of what we're doing with the analysis right now with the funding. Uh, we're hoping to have that done pretty quick. And then uh, in April, we think the recommendations, because of that framework we're building, will kind of fall into place on their own. And then we're hoping to have it published, fingers crossed. You know, it has to go through that uh, governmental review process uh, in May of this year. Um, next slide. Trey said, uh, you guys can't ask any questions until after. So uh, Dan's going to get all the questions because everybody will have that fresh in his mind in their minds at that point. But uh, I'd love to answer anything you guys have questions about and appreciate the opportunity to talk about truck. Parking. <clears throat> Trey, you're muted. You're muted, Trey. Sorry, I just realized I was talking to myself. Uh, so with that, uh, Mike, we uh, greatly appreciate you informing us and updates uh, to the regional truck parking study. It was some great information uh, that you shared with us. All right, so our uh, final presenter here is Dan Murray. Uh, he's a senior vice president of the American Transportation Research Institute, uh, also known as ATRI. Uh, Dan brings more than 28 years of experience to the table in the transportation sector, including trucking research and economics, transportation safety technologies, and autonomous vehicles. At Atri, Dan is responsible for managing transportation research, testing, and evaluation activities, and also leads multiple national activities, which includes the U.S. Department of Transportation-sponsored Freight Mobility Initiative. Dan is also vice chair of the Truck and Research Committee and serves on the boards of the Freight Mobility Research Institute, Mid-America Transportation Center, Northwestern University Telemobility Institute. And the uh, that's, that's good, Trey. <laughs> I, I, I appreciate that, but I'm, I'm not, uh, I don't need a, the, the three-page uh, curricula vitae, but thank you. <laughs> sure. All right, go ahead. I, I I fear people are going to fall asleep when all the good stuff's coming up. At the <laughs> um, well, thank you very much, Trey, and and uh, and folks for for joining us today. Happy Thursday. Um, Mike and Chris had a few slides with very in depth, thoughtful commentary. Whereas I have six hundred slides, and I'm going to have to speak very very quickly to get this done in the next four hours that they've given me. 
Um, so I, I, just a couple of 30 seconds on uh, infomercial on Atri. Um, and Jason, it doesn't look like it's advancing. I don't know if you did transfer it to me. Oh, there we go. So uh, Atri is a not-for-profit research arm of the trucking industry. We do research in a whole bunch of different areas. Uh, Trey covered a couple of those in, in my bio. Uh, most importantly, all of our research uh, is pushed out to everyone free of charge. So I'd urge you to go to our website, truckingresearch.org, uh, sign up for our contact database, peruse the various studies, uh, dozens of studies on truck parking in particular. Uh, and again, all of our research is, is pushed out. Uh, my board of directors are CEOs of these companies. I'm sure many of them are familiar to you. Um, None of my board members are on this webinar, so I'll tell you an equally sage group is a research advisory committee, which is made up of carriers, vendors, driver groups, law enforcement, federal and state government, uh, academics. Uh, Caroline Mays of the Texas DOT uh, was a long running member of our research advisory committee. So everything we do at ATRI has to be essentially identified and approved by our, our RAC, uh, which includes uh, truck parking, of course. <clears throat> I also want to point out that we survey every year thousands and thousands of truck drivers and motor carrier executives, and we come up with the sort of the equivalent of a David Letterman top 10 list. Uh, the number in orange is the previous year. Um, but the reason I show you this is when you separate out uh, truck drivers from motor carriers, you discover truck parking has been a truck driver's number one issue three years in a row. And People in government are often like, seriously, all the issues a truck driver deals with, you know, daily, monthly, yearly, and truck parking's number one three years in a row. Uh, it's because, as, as Chris pointed out, it's not just about hours of service, compliance, and fatigue management. Uh, it's staging for e-commerce fulfillment centers. Uh, it's essentially, you know, staging outside of an urban area so they can avoid rush hours. And of course, what's really problematic is, is as urbanization occurs and suburbanization, key locations are getting pushed farther and farther out. Hence, it's a, it's a huge issue for us. Um, this is some of the data related to the report that, that Chris referenced, which is truck drivers spend a substantial amount of time, uh, unpaid time, looking for truck parking. Uh, in particular, they're also parking in unauthorized and undesignated locations. Uh, multiple times a week. This is not just a violation in many instances of local laws, hours of service laws, et cetera, but it's creating really a, a safety issue uh, that concerns the entire motoring public. Consequently, atri has been involved in dozens of truck parking studies. In fact, our, our truck GPS data was used by TxDOT both for the statewide truck parking study uh, as well as the statewide freight uh, plan. And I'm just gonna show you a couple quick slides um, as well as the, the, the Mastos uh, project that, that Mike referenced. Um, we designed, in fact, the original uh, real-time truck parking information system in Minnesota, which was expanded uh, to many of the Mastos states. So there's a lot of activity. I will tell you as a side note, if we don't have enough capacity and we don't have enough funding, as, as Mike mentioned, real-time truck parking information systems are low-hanging fruit for us. But at the end of the day, we need substantially more spaces, more capacity. And I'm really excited that Congress right now, as we speak, is discussing and debating a, a bipartisan bill that would add $755 million in new dedicated uh, competitive grants for truck parking. So if and when that passes, which I think will happen within the next month, uh, we will have a new source of funding to focus on capacity opportunities. When you look at our truck GPS data, this is the largest truck stop in the United States. You can see with the, the GPS data color coded, red is a stopped or parked truck, that even the largest truck stop in the United States is at over capacity many hours of the day and they start to park on shoulders and exit ramps. If you start to look at public rest stops, which is another one here in, in Iowa, you look to the right and you see the rest stop is completely full. And unfortunately, what happens is they start to park on the entrance and exit ramps. In fact, so much so that you look way to the right, you'll see trucks parking on the entrance and exit ramps there. Now, the insurance industry data tells us that one of the two most expensive crashes that occur in the trucking industry are rear end crashes. In fact, two thirds of all 
rear end crashes with a truck uh, result in a fatality. So this is a big issue for both the state DOTs, not just to support freight and truck parking, uh, but to reduce crashes and, and truck involved fatalities. It's a big issue for us as an industry and as a country. Again, using the truck GPS data, we've identified truck bottlenecks. And I'm, I'm happy to say Texas is number one. Good news is, is Houston is the worst of the locations in Texas, not Dallas. But um, this is a, a big issue for us because as, as Chris and Mike have said, when you delay a truck, all of a sudden my necessary truck parking to comply with hours of service, staging, um, and avoid rush hour traffic uh, gets dramatically changed from what I intended it to be. So a secondary opportunity for us is to use the new infrastructure funding to eliminate truck bottlenecks uh, and then get us back in a truck parking network that's much more reasonable and expected. Um, now, the, the other part of my conversation today <clears throat> beyond truck parking directly is the impact of electric trucks uh, on the industry and what that might do to truck parking. They're vo very closely uh, intertwined. So we have a study that came out uh, about a year ago that looked at zero emission trucks I'm not going to spend much time on this. I urge you to grab hold of it. At the end of the day, it doesn't look like over-the-road trucking is going to move aggressively into electric trucks. They're only about 30% cleaner. Uh, if you look far, far to the right, you'll discover that hydrogen fuel cell trucks have many more attributes that, that line up with over-the-road trucking. Uh, over-the-road trucking doesn't get home every night for charging. I only get 250 miles on a charge and then I have to stop and charge for hours again. So that, that's problematic. Also with electric trucks, and again, we're particularly talking the class seven, eight, classic 18 wheelers, uh, the longer the battery range means the heavier the battery. And because we're, we're limited to 80,000 pounds on the national highway system, we get an extra 2000 pounds for an auxiliary power unit. Uh, these batteries weigh between easily 12 and 17,000 pounds which is lost revenue weight. So the longer the trip is, the heavier the battery, the less money I make on any one trip. So this is going to be an issue. And again, it's exclusive to battery electric because of the weight of the batteries, something that we don't see in hydrogen fuel cell. In addition, we don't have anywhere in this country near the electricity needed. States like California, which already have brownouts just due to air conditioning drain, you know, will need 60% more electricity uh, than they produce today. So generation is gonna be a big issue on the electricity side. And then we get to the connection between charging and parking. We have a shortage of parking now, but the next crisis 2.0 is gonna be, where do I charge? These trucks require a substantial amount of electricity, as I mentioned. If you look at the installation costs that California is expending right now, Caltrans in particular, and you multiply that by the number of spaces, because essentially every parking space should have a charger so that I can uh, I can engage hours of service with charging. Uh, obviously, it's the only logical economical uh, model. You come up with $35 billion just to electrify the spaces out there, both public and private. That's obviously an issue. We went and looked in their latest study at a public rest stop right in uh, sunny Texas here and found out that the roughly 67 spaces, which could stand to charge 126 times in a day, would have a greater electric draw than 5,000 US households based on current kilowatt drains. Uh, so again, we're gonna need more electricity, let alone more charging stations, and they need to be at truck parking locations so that we're not doubling the number of spaces needed one for hours of service compliance, one for charging. So we, we need to synthesize those two demands. At the end of the day, a battery electric truck is gonna cost between $380,000 and $420,000. We don't have the charging infrastructure in place and we need uh, high-speed chargers. We can't plug into a 120 kilowatt Tesla today. Um, they're not as clean as people think, particularly when you look at the Department of Energy life cycle GREET model, and incorporate carbon production at mining and disposal. Now here's where I take a shot at our friends in California. So they're essentially gonna be banning internal combustion engines, car and truck by 2030 to 2035 uh, and requiring that everything at that time period is electric. 
Well, today they have a four point voluntary resolution where they're urging everybody to not charge electric vehicles. So California has about 10 years to figure out how they're gonna move freight and move people without charging electric vehicles and without an internal combustion engine. So that's gonna be problematic for us. Um, technically, that's the uh, end of my presentation. I wanted to make sure we had a lot of time for q and I will give you one anecdote that I think is, is pretty important for understanding the scale of electric needs for trucking. Uh, my chairman, Derek Leathers, who's a CEO of Werner Trucking, uh, went to uh, build a new truck terminal in Joliet, Illinois. And he thought, I'm gonna be foresightful if electric trucks really are coming, I'm gonna put in 50, five zero, 50 high-speed chargers at this new truck terminal. Submitted the blueprint to the city of Joliet, uh, Illinois, and they came back with, uh, you know, what the hell are you building here? And he said, it's a truck terminal. He said, what's this infrastructure, this electric infrastructure? He said, it's a charging network for 50 trucks. They rejected the blueprint because those 50 trucks were a greater daily electric draw than the entire city of Joliet. So Duke Energy did an assessment to uh, public utility, of course, to see if, if those numbers are accurate. And sure enough, 50 trucks on a daily basis have the same electrical draw as the uh, Empire State Building. So the country has got to make some philosophical decisions, but at the end of the day, at the very least, we need truck parking to start to consider the grid requirements to electrify truck parking, probably all 313 spaces, or potentially move into hydrogen fuel cell. Many, many states right now are applying uh, to the DOT and the DOE for uh, grants to both calculate and blueprint electric charging stations, but also hydrogen fuel distribution networks. So it's an exciting time, uh, but we have a lot of issues and challenges ahead of us. And with that, um, I will definitely shut up and, and join my colleagues in any questions you may have. Great, thank you so much, Dan. Um, we we really appreciate that. Uh, and as well, thank you, Mike and Chris, again. Uh, this, we've reached the section for our questions and answers of our webinar. And we'd definitely like to welcome everyone uh, if you want to uh, present a question, uh, put it in the, into the chat uh, or raise your hand and we can, uh, uh, open it up for you to ask your question. Do we have any? Okay. So from Alex, uh, I've seen here, we've heard a lot about the planning and funds, but where is the truck parking being built today? Where is capacity expanding or is it shrinking? So I'll open that up. I don't know if, uh, Mike, if you want to take a stab at that for the. I can take a stab at it from the uh, North Central Texas, uh, North Central Texas uh, region. Uh, obviously, Dan and Chris can give a much more um, macro view of that thing across the nation. The big trend we've seen, you know, when we did our uh, truck stop inventory in 2018 and now in 2023 we're seeing uh the smaller scale operations go get shut down and we're seeing larger and larger scale operations being pushed to the periphery of the region we're, and we did a land use analysis a, a couple of years ago and we're seeing the same thing just with freight uh infrastructure overall is being pushed and pushed further out um you know, a good example of this is uh, a couple of years ago, Loves, which Jason, as you know, traditionally doesn't always build the spaces with the ton uh, or location with the ton of spaces. They've opened one uh, up in Alma down uh, off of 45, and I think it's like 150 spaces. So I think from an industry point of view, we're seeing larger scale, bigger name brand things uh, or locations moving into our region. Waxahachie just got one a couple of years ago. Um, lots of stuff out in Weatherford like this, uh, larger scale stuff. 
but that doesn't eliminate the need we have for truck parking within the region. And of course, um, we don't have any public truck parking in the region. And one of the things we've talked to TxDOT it, about is maybe using, you know, some pilot projects, as you, you know, Jason, maybe some smaller scale stuff, public public rest areas more in the core of the region, you know? So that's what, that's what we're, that's the trend we're seeing uh, is less smaller independent shops, bigger name brand things. Okay. Yeah. Thank you, Mike. Uh, Dan, did you want to uh, elaborate again? This was just uh, the question posed, where is truck parking being built today? Where is the capacity yeah. expanding or shrinking? Well, again, when you look at the different um, business models and, and operational needs of the trucking industry, it goes way, way beyond hours of service compliance. Uh, and quite candidly, um, state DOTs are very freight and trucking savvy. Uh, MPOs, um, there's a dozen, uh, including yours, that are cognizant of freight issues and working hard with industry to figure it out. But I think the big problem we face is the not in my backyard mentality of local units of government. Uh, our friends in Minneapolis, Minnesota, in fact, about a year ago passed a, a city council um, resolution that trucks cannot park in the city of Minneapolis. Well, you know, a few of us sort of drool over the possibility of not providing them with any cargo and freight anymore, but um, that's not realistic. So I think one of the biggest issues we have is educating everybody, uh, particularly local units of government, on the criticality of freight. It's 5% of this country's GDP. Uh, everything you have on your body in, in your office is delivered by a truck. Um, but the mentality is, well, we need the storage stock, but we just don't want the trucks there. So I do see truck parking getting pushed farther and farther out, uh, as Mike indicated. Um, and that's going to be problematic because suddenly our, our goods are not going to get de delivered tomorrow afternoon, sometimes this morning. And that concept of free shipping is going to go away pretty quickly if the cost of transportation continues to increase. We have a, an operational cost of trucking report. You might want to go to our website and grab. Uh, and the cost per hour and cost per mile to operate a truck reached its highest level ever in the 2022 report. So transportation is getting expensive and truck parking is playing a small role in that. Okay, great. And Chris, did you want to add anything to that for the question? No, I really don't have much to add. You know, Mike and Dan covered most of it. One thing I would say, you know, from the business side or private sector side that I've seen, I've had several conversations in the last year and seen a real uptick in the interest of investment and, and you know, private parking locations. Um, you know, it is a viable business model for many, um, and then, you know, it never hurts to invest in land. So those two come together to, you know, really create some interest in the notion of the private sector, um, making investment into in, in parking, uh, but the business model is to be proven. And then it really comes down to, you know, making the driver community aware that those are available and getting the attention of three and a half million people who, basically get paid and never sit in one place and be always be moving isn't a really easy proposition but the private sector is definitely paying attention and uh, i think will be a you know contribute to the answer once we figure it out at some point all right yeah thank you for um, adding to that and i um so thank you alex for the question i haven't seen any others in the chat if they're um, don't see any hands raised. We did have one posed that came through with the registration. And so I'll um, uh, deliver this to you all. Um, what technology solutions do you feel will best resolve the truck parking availability issue? So Chris, maybe I can uh, have you uh, take that one. Yeah, there's a lot. There's a whole lot of possibilities um, from the technology perspective, you know, ranging from sensors and spots to cameras um, to crowdsource information like we have and others. Um, I don't think there is any one answer. Uh, I think all of those are, are effective in their own degree, um, some more so than others from when you get down to a granularity level of what space is available exactly when. 
Um, I really think the key of the technology is that it has ubiquitous coverage and is available to as many drivers as possible. You know, I don't know about you guys, but it seems like every day I have another page of apps on my phone. And um, if, if, there's, if there were 10, 15 different apps to find parking at any given moment, that's a lot more apps to ask a driver to have to comb through when they're already taxed for time and they shouldn't be using their phone. They never should be using their phone when they're driving. So um, all those different technology plays, in my opinion, need to come together and to be able at least be able to be consumed and presented in many ways so that it's a, a one stop shop as much as practical for the drivers and not a whole another page of apps that they need to look at to try to find a place to go. I would just pipe in, Jason, that um, the, the system we designed and tested with the Minnesota Department of Tran Transportation was, was a video system, uh, automated cameras, scanning for pixels. Uh, we designed it so it'd work in snow and even when the, the striping is, is you know, invisible in that regard. Uh, it's a phenomenal system because it counts spaces. Uh, and when you get into particularly private truck stops, the trucks are parked all over and you can you can sit there and count trucks in and count trucks out but at the end of the day uh the spaces might be filled and it'll tell you there's 10 available uh etc so i love video the problem is is it's expensive it's kind of the cadillac of systems um so again the the, the big demand from the trucking industry is these are good systems we need to standardize them i sit on the national the usdot's national truck parking coalition and we've urged them develop standardization. It's just what Chris said. I, I don't want to have one system count spaces, one system color code, and they mean different things. Um, but we, we haven't gotten that yet out of Washington, D.C. That would be nice. But at the end of the day, we just need hundreds of thousands, potentially, certainly tens of thousands of more spaces. The system we built today, a lot of it started with the, in, you know, the interstate system built in 1956. This is the 21st century. We need to see where that parking needs to be today. And that might not be where it was designed 40, 50 years ago. All right, yeah. Uh, thank you, Dan. The Another question that did pop in the chat uh, is, uh, again, from Alex, and how can drivers advocate for more parking? Uh, you know, essentially adding to that, that there's, you know, lots of the, localities banning truck parking. So is there any thoughts, ideas, how can the drivers advocate for more parking? Well, nobody will jump in, Dan Murray again here. I'll tell you the, the national associations are doing a very, very good job. OIDA, Owner Operator Independent Driver Association, they have 153,000 members, the American Trucking Associations. The, the president of OIDA and ATA both signed a joint letter that went to uh, Secretary Buttigieg in Congress saying we need more parking. When when you get the the truck drivers getting together with the motor carriers and and jointly signing a letter, that's pretty powerful. And it was it was heard, which is why we now have potentially a new seven hundred and fifty five million dollars. But but the person, I guess Alex, who wrote that, he's right. The local units are the problem. We can have all the money we want, but if they zone it out of truck parking and and residential to residential, we have an issue. So we have to educate the local units of government, uh, show up at city councils, distribute materials, work with the MPOs and the state DOTs to educate um, local, you know, politicians. I think that'll help. And if I can jump in real quick, Jason, I would say that um, yes. you know the advocacy is huge in order to get the spaces built. But I'd also encourage you know everyone to um, when they when you especially trucker path users existing in future um, when they find a place that's um, a good safe legal parking place for a truck that it doesn't show up in our app let us know and we'll put it there to let everyone know you know it's it's really core to our mission to to make as many places available and known to the largest population as we possibly can so they can find it more easily great great to know there too um yeah i think um the, uh, all those avenues like you said it it certainly it's it takes a, a number of um ways to kind of get this uh out in the in the forefront um there's a lot of folks involved and um certainly i know this is a very uh you know important and uh complicated 
issue that there, I'm not looking or I'm not seeing, sorry, I'm not seeing any other questions in the chat and or any hands up, uh, just making sure I'm not missing anyone. So, um, so yeah, we, we do appreciate uh, the questions that came in and, and uh, the additional insights. So thank you again to Mike, Chris, and Dan. Um, and real quickly, as we have a few minutes here to, to wrap up, we want to take a moment to pass along information we've got uh, provided in the presentation. And uh, one of those things is this, Trey mentioned earlier, we have our saving money and reducing truck emission program. And part of that, what we're trying to do, again, this is our uh, NCT COG uh, initiative uh, here in our region to really uh, try to pr provide information to our local fleets and the trucking industry. And we are trying to develop a vendor directory so that we can um, have this available and for fleets and truck drivers to know the vendors that have that are offering the smart way verified technologies um, and, and you know maybe another thing about being part of this is helping to be a part of this program where we can uh, educate and promote strategies that are uh, <laughs> beneficial to the truck drivers and so all this is uh, free to join and free to use but this is an initiative that we're looking to expand upon. So those that might be out there uh, that could be, you know, a, a retailer, a, a you know, a truck dealer, uh, sorry, a truck, uh, yeah, dealership that uh, also has various the smart way technologies. Uh, feel free to sign up. We've got the uh, a link to our form here to sign up and then be part of our vendor directory. And then we also just want to pass along information that our Council of Governments also houses the Dallas-Fort Worth Clean Cities Coalition. And we just offer this information too because it's here to provide fleet support uh, for uh, efficiency measures. You know, if, if a fleet is looking to expand into alternative fuel vehicles, then there are lots of uh, resources and tools that can be shared. And this the Clean Cities is really designed so that it can be helping to advance economic, environmental, and energy uh, security efforts and strategies to not only the public and local governments, but also our private fleets in our region. So this is just highlighting you know, what it is that they provide through funding, support or technical assistance or planning for the future. And um, so we welcome any of those in our audience that want to get involved. Uh, we do have uh, a number of ways to uh, connect with the clean cities and uh, we've got those uh, provided for you right here. So with that, uh, I'll hand it back over to Trey for uh, any closing uh, points, but uh, I really appreciate everyone's uh, being involved in our uh, presentation today. All right. Thank you, Jason. I'd like to uh, also once again uh, thank our presenters as well as our attendees. And uh, at this point, We'll go ahead and uh, stop with the recording. <laughs>